perkenalkan Miss Ramona Blenes as guest speaker from Adam Smith Business School and Bapak Christian Agung Prasetyo as guest speaker from Polytechnic of State Finance Time. We thank God Almighty because over the blessings and graces we can gather at this webinar with healthy condition. So before we started this webinar, let us pray in accordance with trust respectively. May God make this event run smoothly and conducive. Pray start in individual beliefs begin. Enough. So to open this webinar, there will be an opening speech that will be delivered by the Director of Polytechnic of State Finance Stand. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Bapak Rahmadi Murwanto. Thank you very much, uh, MC, for uh, today's webinar. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon. Salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Dear all distinguished speakers, especially Miss Ramona Blanes, apologize if I'm not saying it correctly from Adam Smith Business School of the University of Glasgow, United Kingdom, and Mr. Christian Agung, the lecturer at the PKN Stan, and also all of the participants in today's webinar. I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar, which will discuss the potential of FinTech in enabling public value. Digitalization has been spreading into every sector. It enables economic activities to grow in a more effective and efficient way, which is called the Industrial Revolution 4.0. The revolution is definitely true for the case of financial services. Financial technology, or as we always uh, abbreviate as FinTech, have grown significantly in recent years. The fast pace of technological development combined with the potential cost reduction is the key of the value of fintech. Through such technological evolution, now people's expectations are changing. The demand for easy access to funding and capital has become a new opportunity to utilize fintech. As the world's fourth most populous country and with more than 60% of its people representing working age in 2019, according to the data from the Central Bureau of Statistics, Indonesia has unique economic potential. This working age group has the potential to drive the Indonesia's gross domestic product through customer spending and local production activity, if it is fully utilized. To boost the economic growth, providing equal access to financing will become important because it can create multiplier effects to the Indonesian economy. FinTech has the potential to solve this challenge. Enabled by technology and based on robust data, they can help to increase access, improve convenience, slash costs, and deliver more inclusive financial services. In fact, in 2019, around 64.8% of the total Indonesia population had been connected to the internet. Apart from its benefit to society, FinTech has the implications for the government and regulators. Several issues have arisen as the government has to balance between ensuring the customer protection while providing a regulatory environment which encourages just uh, innovations. In this regard, this webinar aims to 
present a discussion that enlightens the way we see the development of financial technology in the era of the Internet of Things. I believe that by participating in this webinar, we are in the right place at the right time. To Ms. Ramona Blanes, I hope this webinar will bring good cooperation in the future between our school, Polytechnic of State Finance Town, and the University of Blue. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Lately, I wish you all enjoy this webinar. Thank you. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, sir, for the insightful opening speech to open this webinar. So moving right along. There will be two discussions talking about our main topic today about the financial technology. The first one will be talking about the potential of financial technology in enabling public value. And the second one will be talking about the current landscape of financial technology in Indonesia. Both discussion will be led by Ibu Gusti Ayu Indarat Nasari as our moderator. Ibu Inda currently work as lecturer in Polytechnic of State Finance Town. She was graduated from her Master of Commerce in University of Adelaide, and she continued her study in University of York in United Kingdom. She finished her Doctor of Philosophy in 2016. Ibu Inda also experienced a many role in the Directorate General of Texas, start, starting from practitioner until the head division of strategic planning at the JP head office. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ibu Gusti Ayu Indarat Nasari. Hello, can everyone hear me well? Yes. Yes, okay. Thank you, Theo. Thank you for the introduction. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Selamat siang semuanya. Or, may I say good morning to those participants who come from the UK. My name is Inda. I am a lecturer here at um, the Polytechnic of State Finance Span, and I will be your moderator today in this webinar. Welcome, and thank you very much for joining our webinar. I see a couple of participants uh, from the United Kingdom. Hello. Good morning. And I also see uh, some participants uh, from Sumatra, from Kalimantan, and even from Papua. Yeah, lots of participants come uh, not only uh, from the Polytechnic of State Finance Time, but also from other universities as well as other organizations. Thank you everyone for coming, attending and joining our webinar. I also would like to thank the team who are behind the screen, who have prepared and made this webinar happen. Thank you team. All right, I truly hope wherever you are watching this webinar right now, I hope you are safe and sound physically and mentally healthy, or at least try to always, uh, to always try to find reasons to keep healthy, especially during this pandemic time. Speaking about the pandemic, I think you all agree that it brings significant changes in our life. It has changed the way we work, the way we interact with other people, also the way we do things including financial activities. In the area of finance, we've seen an increasing growth of financial technology or fintech during the pandemic. For example, the use of caseless payment has been encouraged in the condition of social distancing. Fintech is believed could enhance financial inclusion and broaden access to financial services by capitalizing technological advances. Despite the growth, there are many different definitions of FinTech. So it may raise question what FinTech really is. Despite the growth, there are many um, different definitions and also 
maybe you would ask how it works. And when I say that FinTech could enhance financial inclusion, you may ask, what is financial inclusion? How could FinTech can enhance financial inclusion? And despite the benefits, you may be also asking, is there any challenge or potential issue that we face in the rise of FinTech? Well, those are some questions that will be answered in this webinar. Okay, and we are so honored today because we have two wonderful speakers who will give us insight on the issue of financial technology. The first speaker is Dr. Ramona Brains from Adam Smith Business School, University of, of Glasgow, United Kingdom. If you ask Adam Smith, yes, Adam Smith Business School is named in the honor of Adam Smith, the father of modern economic and alumnus of the University of Glasgow. Adam Smith Business School has been named number one in the United Kingdom for accounting and finance. What is more interesting is the university has a master program specializing in financial technology. And Ibu Ramona, who is our speaker today, also involved in designing the course. With her expertise and experience, we are so honored to have her in today's seminar. The second speaker is Dr. Christian Agung Pastil. I usually address him as Mas Agung. Mas Agung is a lecturer at uh, the Polytechnic of uh, State Finance Fund. I will introduce each speaker in more details later on before each of them delivers their presentation. Okay, uh, before we go to the presentation, at the beginning of uh, this event, I have shared a small ice breaking. Yeah, can I share the screen again? Yeah. I did a small ice breaking to the participant while they were waiting for the seminar to start. And I asked one question. I asked them to describe feedback in one word. And the most commonly word that are right by the participant or technology, disruption, kesempatan, or opportunities. And we also see tantangan or challenges, money. Um, there are also easy, uh, go pay, etc. Maybe some of these words will be discussed by our speakers today. Okay, thank you everyone for participating in uh, the the uh, speaking. Okay, without further ado, let's start the webinar with our first presenter, Ibu Ramona Blains. Ibu Ramona, are you there? Yep. Thank you, Bu Inda. Oh, yeah. Let me introduce you in more detail before you start uh -huh. your presentation. Okay. Ibu Ramona has more than 20 years of experience working in senior positions in financial services and management consultancy organization. Ibu Ramona has a, an MBA specializing in Islamic banking and finance. Her PhD research explored the concept of public value and the public sector reforms through the lens of intelligent transportation systems. Ibu Ramona, you have about 45 minutes uh, to talk on the issue of fintech and public value. The platform is yours. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Let me try and share my screen. Hold on a second. Selamat siang, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here and also thank you for inviting me to this webinar. My name is Ramona Blanes. Please call me Ramona or Bu Ramona. 
um, I am here um, to share my thoughts as um, or discuss uh, my research in the fields of fintech and public value. Jika tidak keberatan, saya akan berbicara dalam bahasa Inggeris kerana saya tidak fasih berbahasa Indonesia. However, jika tidak faham atau ada soalan atau butuh klarifikasi, please uh, stop me, berhentikan saya, uh, angkat tangan uh, and saya akan boleh cuba terangkan dalam bahasa Melayu. I know it is more difficult to understand someone we, when we cannot see each other. So I will try to make my point slowly. And again, stop me if I am going too fast. Please use the hands up button if you do. Can I, before I start properly, can I just check that everybody can hear me? Yes. Hands up? You can hear. Yep. Okay. Brilliant. So, to start, my main research interest is on how public sector managers can leverage the technologies which fintech and other financial institutions in general are adopting to improve their service provision internally as well as externally to the public. So, in the next 45 minutes or so, I will try to be shorter than that. Uh, I will try to cover my definition of fintech. Like uh, Ibu Inda mentioned, there are so many definitions of fintech. But for this talk, we will we will focus it into my definition of fintech. Uh, I'll also cover public value and the service provision process. Financial inclusion, which again, uh, Bu Indah mentioned earlier, which is something I believe that fintech and the public sector should collaborate on. Then I will look at just one feature of fintech, uh, which is the mobile payment challenges in Indonesia. And towards the end, I will touch a little bit on potential issues on taxation because I know there are a lot of uh, tax uh, accountants and auditors here cyber security, as well as ethics. I am a great believer in interactive sharing of knowledge rather than one-way monologue. So please feel free if you need to uh, um, contribute, let me know. And before we go to the next slide, I'm going to try something if you don't mind. Can you see the Padlet on the, um, on the slide? The HTTPS. Um, dot dot slash slash padlet dot com do you have your mobile phone or poncel i believe you call it in indonesia if you do can you click that link from your poncel and post your own definition of fintech and public value please i'm going to give you around about uh, a minute to do that if we can so it it is https padlet oops sorry padlet.com slash ramona underscore blindness one stroke fintech what you should see from there is this So if you can quickly add, click this and add your definition or what you think, not definition, what, what you think is FinTech. And public value. So it is your own definition. There is no wrong or right answer, but I just want to see what it is that in your mind you think is uh, fintech and what is uh, 
public value. You can write it in Indonesia if that's more uh, you're more comfortable with that. That's fine as well. I can understand, I think, a little bit when I read. I, I'm just not good at speaking it. What about public value? You've commented a lot on fintech. Does anybody have anything to say about public value? Okay, um, so a lot of you basically are thinking of fintech as it is a fusion of finance and technology. It is a financial instrument using tech platform. It's a tool. I see from um, Ibu Indas um, icebreaker uh, just now, you also talk about fintech as disruption, uh, kesempatan. So that is, I would say, I'm just going to shop, uh, stop sharing this screen, but please continue writing down if you can. Uh, and I will we'll go back to that later. I'm going back to my PowerPoint now. Sorry, technology doesn't work for me. Okay, um, so can you see my uh, my PowerPoint back again? Yes. Yes, you can see. It. Okay, thank you. So I would agree with most of you. Um, To me, what is fintech? When we, what we need to do is first maybe step back a little and ask ourselves what is finance. In this context, when we talk about finance, we are referring to four main areas. One is the paying for goods and services, including, um, of course, taxes. As you know, there as I know, there are many tax experts here today. Two, moving money from today to tomorrow, which is savings and investing, also something I believe that the uh, Ministry of Finance is interested in. Three, moving money from tomorrow to today, which is giving or getting credits or financing. And four, maybe 
important from a regulatory perspective, especially, is managing the risks that arise from the previous mentioned services and processes. Because of this, there are so many definitions and variations of fintech. To me, fintech can be any combination of technology in the financial services or organization in this specific fintech sector. Now, a lot of people talk about fintech as if it's a new thing, like uh, it just happened yes, a few years ago. But to me, fintech has happened at least 20, 30 years ago. So it is basically technology that you use in the financial services. And I just want to clarify that because when I talk about fintech, I am referring to the many underlying technologies that are being used to deliver financial services. So it is the technologies rather than the fintech sector, because a lot of people now, when they talk about fintech, they're talking about the fintech sector, uh, that the companies within the fintech. When I talk about fintech, I'm talking about the technologies that are currently being used, not just in the fintech sector, but across uh, other sectors as well. On this slide, for example, I have listed in the block on the uh, left side of the, no, not the left side, on the right side uh, of the slide, quite a number of texts that are be currently being used to improve financial services offered to individuals and organizations. These improvements can be evolutionary or revolutionary. What do I mean by evolutionary? Evolutionary means that the, the, the improvement or the changes uh, you see as small incremental change, whereas revolutionary are the changes take over or as the word you used in uh, in this um, um, uh, ice breaking, it disrupt, it's disrupt the, the current product or services. So evolutionary would be the little changes that improves the, the tech improves the services. Revolutionary means that this change is completely going to take over the world. So for example, like we used to um, use horses in order to get from A to B. But now we don't use horses, we use uh, cars from, to get from A to B. Maybe in the future, uh, we're going to use bicycle instead of cars from A to B. Don't know. We don't know yet with all this COVID happening. So when it, it takes over, we call it revolutionary. When, when it is incremental, we call it evolutionary. And I think you will notice that a lot of the changes in fintech right now are more evolutionary rather than uh, revolutionary. So we are talking about artificial intelligence. What is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is also known as machine intelligence. And it is currently being used in mainly robo advisors, uh, ranking of customer risk profile, and also underwriting. Uh, the second one, data analytics, or I put in bracket big data analytics because it can create a digital log of a customer's banking activity, identify potential errors, and provide seamless support. So the data and the forecasting can also help organizations recommend the right services and products based on the customer's individual spending behavior, for example. The third technology that's, uh, that's quite prevalent are biometrics. These are mainly used for identification and access control. And as we know, biometrics is not just being used in the financial services, but also uh, in your passport, for example, for identification. The fourth one, probably when people talk about fintech, the first thing that comes to their mind is this, which is blockchain and the distributed ledger technology. I 
think when I mention it, the first thing that comes to most minds are Bitcoins and cryptocurrency. But I would like to argue that the best use of Bitcoin and or distributed ledger technology could be to enhance trust between the users or at least minimize distrust due to the characteristics of the technologies. The fifth technology that are, that are currently being used are cloud computing. This technology offers benefits such as scalability. Uh, scalability may, uh, meaning that uh, right now, if we use servers, then our server is normally limited to a number of participants. But with cloud computing, uh, there is more participants that they can, uh, they can address at one time. It will also reduce IT costs, information technology costs. It helps with business continuity because there is no server at your place or at your organization. So if anything happened at that place, then the business can go on because it can easily be accessed from anywhere. And also with cloud computing, you see a lot more technology innovation as well as adoption. Because again, because of the easy access to it and the cost. In other words, with cloud computing, you have the speed to market factor, endless amounts of virtual computing power, and unlimited storage space. The sixth um, technology is something that you already are using right now, which is internet and also the internet of things. I'm sure you know what internet is, so I don't have uh, to explain that. The internet of things, IOT, uh, really any devices that can connect to the internet, such as your smartphones, uh, Alexa, um, Siri, Google Play, smart home meters, uh, anything really. They allow greater insight into the customer, instant data collection and processing, improve the quality of decision making, and the efficiency of risk management. The seventh uh, technology is probably something that's not as, um, as often used in a lot of banking, which is mixed, augmented, and virtual reality. This are normally used in games, but a lot of banks have taken this up and actually used them in conjunction with property selling and financing, so mortgage. For example, if uh, you, you go to a property developer and they have, they plan to build a house and you want to buy a house, but they haven't built it yet. Right now, uh, what you do is you look at the plan and then you choose from the plan and then you th they show you some photos and then you have to imagine yourself how it would look in your house. But with virtual reality, or mixed reality, augmented reality, what you need to do is the potential buyer will put on a headset and then will be immersed in a fictional space that is artificially generated by a software. It activates several of our senses, uh, mainly our vision, our hearing, our touch, our motion, to make the experience more intuitive and immersive. And for some banks, they even have sensors that will actually show you how excited the, uh, the potential buyer is about whatever is being shown. So uh, it, it, it goes back to how many percent is the, this buyer likely to buy the property. This, of course, and for some banks, it's not just for mortgage. Uh, BNP Paribas, for example, have introduced it so that corporate buyers, corporate customers actually have an immersive uh, experience 
wearing this and they go together with their banker and see where the bank can add value with their banking services and products. And finally, 8.1 is quantum computing. This is still being developed, but the potential use is massive. For example, uh, trading in exchange rates and arbitrage, as well as to detect fraudulent activities by recognizing such patterns of behavior at a faster rate than currently conceivable. I think this is an important point to remember. Some of the so-called new financial services are built over underlying technologies which have been in existence for quite a while. For example, the concept of distributed ledger has been around since Roman times, but have gained popularity since the proof of work concept introduced by blockchain, sorry, introduced for blockchain uh, by Bitcoin. So what I am trying to say here is sometimes we need to look at things from a slightly different perspective to resolve age old problems. So because the biggest problem public sector managers have right now is how to ensure that the decisions they make with regards to policies and programs, for example, address the wants and the needs of the public. After all, I would argue that public sectors exist to serve the public. So one idea is perhaps to look at what I, we call the concept of public value or nilai public. Let's think about it for a second. Normally, when government policies or programs are announced, they always say that they're doing this or they're introducing the policy for the interest of the public, for the interest of the public. So is public value different from public interest? Let me try and say that again in Bahasa Indonesia as this is important. And important underlying idea. Pada umumnya, ketika kebijakan atau program pemerintah diumumkan, pemerintah selalu mengatakan bahawa kebijakan atau program tersebut bertujuan untuk kepentingan public or public interest. Lalu, apakah public value berbeza dari public interest? So, in simple terms, Public interest is perceived, is the outcome as perceived from the government perspective. Where else public value is the outcome perceived from the public's perspective. So public value adds value to public interest rather than a passive sense of safeguarding interest. So public value, sorry, public interest adalah uh, berdasarkan dari sudut pandangan pemerintah sementara keluaran dari public value adalah berdasarkan dari sudut pandangan public. Maka public value menambahkan nilai terhadap public interest yang di mana uh, membuat kebajikan menjadi tidak pasif dalam memberikan kepentingan atau melayani publik. These values, nilai-nilai ini include and not limited to economic, social, moral, political, cultural and aesthetic values. So, in fact, public value is not just a matter of calculating costs and benefits. I know as accountants uh, and, and as auditors, you like calculating uh, the costs and benefits, things that, are, that can be monetized. Public value is more than the monetized versions. 
it encompasses a lot more. It un, un, encompasses what the public think is nilai, is value, not what we think as government or as uh, as the public um, sector manager is value. If it's what we think, it's public interest. Now we need to now change our mindset and think, okay, we think this is public interest, but is the public thinking that it adds value to the interest? If it adds value to the interest, then it will become public value. For example, not too long ago, we see Bank Indonesia issues a blueprint for the payment system encouraging the use of cashless payment. There are many reasons for it, of course, from the economic and social perspectives. And it seems logical as well in the circumstance that we have today, as it gives the ability to social distance uh, during COVID-19 times. So from the perspective of public interest and public value, Bank Indonesia is implementing a policy for the public's interest because that's what they want and that's that's what they, they're supposed to do. Do something that's good for the public. However, my question is, do the public view this policy as adding value to their lives? Currently, we don't know the answer to it because to deliver public value, there is a need for the public manager to co-create value with the citizens. And what I mean by citizens are individuals and organizations in the community, including those in the third and public sectors. And they do this by listening to, engaging with, and take the information that's given to them by these individuals and organizations and try and shape and inform the public's preferences. So it is not just a matter of giving the public what it wants at a particular point of time. The public manager has got a lot more work to do in the sense that they need to balance out all these differences, needs and wants and think what is it that is the best solution. In short, I define public value as the perception of shared values consequential from direct and indirect dialogues. And I want to stress the word dialogue, uh, which is a two-way or more than two-way uh, discussion rather than a monologue, which is just a one-way with the public which addresses the needs of the present and future generations. So it's, it's not a, an easy thing to do. It's not just for the needs of today, but also the need of tomorrow and forevermore. In Indonesian, I'll try and say this in Indonesian because it's quite important, I think. Uh, the de my definition, I say my definition because it is something that I come out with after my research. Public value adalah persepsi, persepsi tentang nilai konsekuensial dari dialog langsung dan tidak langsung antara manager public dengan public dan hasil dari dialog tersebut akan mengatasi dan menjawab kebutuhan generasi saat ini dan generasi masa depan. So, in the case of cashless payment, the policy or program could be created or co-produced by the public, sorry, with the public by, for example, consulting with individuals and organizations that participate in the payment system. So these will be what we call the direct dialogues and also those who are outside the payment system but will still be affected by the change of the payment method. So these are the indirect dialogues. Now, why, why is it important for you to not just talk to people who are directly affected, but also talk to people who are indirectly affected? I'm going to use an example of uh, a bus instead of um, cashless payment. 
Uh, for example, um, we have a new bus route. So the direct so bus ini akan pergi daripada uh, dari Jakarta uh, ke uh, uh, Surabaya. Yeah. So the bus will go through a different route than the current bus that's going from Jakarta to Surabaya. It will go through different villages, different uh, housing development. Now, does anybody, will any, everybody use the bus? No. So the direct users of the bus will be people who needs to take buses to get from one place to another. So not everybody takes buses, but when the bus gets out of the station and go along these routes, so they go through all this kampung, the bus will um, will um, will give the um, gas. So you have the carbon monoxide, the other uh, house gas, and that affects the route. So even though people are not using the bus, they are still affected by the output of the bus. So that is why it is important that even though you think that you should just talk to the people who use something, in this case, the cashless payment, but there are other people. Think about who are the other people who will be affected by you trying to change the way of payment from cash to cashless. Same, same concept. So you might ask me, why is it then public value is important? My, my simple answer, that there's a lot, we can discuss this uh, a lot more, but my simple answer would be, remember the list of technologies on the previous slide. Remember we have internet and the internet of things. Today's world, today's reality, is so different than before. Before, people do not have access to information as quick as today. So today's world is as real and as fake as it can be, depending on how things work in the internet. So perception is extremely important. So let's put what we have said about public value concept into perspective. In an ideal world, when the public sector or government wish to introduce a new policy or program, they would go through what we call the service provision process, which consists of creating the policy and or the program, and then design and develop the plan for implementation of the policy or program with a set of procedures and activities. And all this will be done with inputs from what we call the authorizing environment. We define authorizing environment as people or organization that have the required power to allow such implementation to happen. For example, if you want to do something in Jakarta, you may need to get Pa'ani's formal or informal support. You also need inputs from the user, otherwise nobody will use it. The dominant stakeholders mean people who have, the, the, the big, big people who have direct involvement in the policy that you want to use, as well as the minor interest groups. Uh, for example, in the bus case, uh, environmental activists. Even in cashless payment, it could be environmental activists as well. And this should be a two-way dialogue. Uh, I stress again, it must not should be. It must be a two-way dialogue. As presented by the orange-brown circles picture on the right side of the slide. Now, you can see that service provision process is in the middle, and then you have inputs from authorizing environment. You have inputs uh, from users, dominant stakeholders, and minor interest group. And you see that the, the arrows are two-way instead of one-way. Right now, 
the current situation with a lot of developing nations, including Indonesia, actually even developed nations, it's not just a problem with developing nations or less developed nations, it's also a problem with a lot of developed nations. The way the, provision, the service provision process is created and implemented is re represented by the blue picture on the left. So you can see that the arrows are going from authority, the authorizing environment, down or sideways to the users and the other uh, stakeholders. This is what we have traditionally done. So it is a one-way street. Uh, in public policy uh, talk, they say this is a top-down decision. Uh, with public value, it's not just top-down or from bottom up, but with, in public value talk, what you need is what we call the holistic um, situation whereby everybody involved need to talk to each other and give, give inputs. Am I saying that you need to take everybody's idea and, 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 and then only you make decision? No, not necessarily, but you need to have a representative uh, of these people in, uh, before you can come up with a solution. Uh, by the way, the source that I am quoting for this diagram is actually my current student at the University of Glasgow, Hannah, who happens to be an Indonesian, and I supervised her dissertation in MSc in FinTech where she looked at the impact of the cashless payment system implementation in Indonesia. And as my, I mentioned in my previous slide, sometimes we need to look at things from a different perspective to address the changing environment. Perhaps for public sector managers, the time is right to start looking at things from a public value angle. I am not at any point disputing that Indonesia have come leaps and bounds better, uh, not just leaps and bounds improved, but better than most other developing nations. For example, I know for a fact that for financial inclusion, Indonesia featured prominently in the financial inclusion support framework group for the World Bank. Um, you have the updated national financial inclusion strategy. You have the adoption of regulations on agent banking, the digital financial services, the alternative dispute resolution, financial information service system credit reporting, and the internal dispute resolution. And those are the few that I got from the World Bank website. So I know a lot has been done in Indonesia. So. A lot of good work is being done. Now, my question is, did any of these updates, adoptions, introduction, have the support of the public? If so, which group have been consulted for all these new updates and changes? I think we all know that in order to be for anything to be successful, we need the support of at least the users. And for it to be truly successful, we also need the support of others who are indirectly linked to the program of policy. So let's think about it for a second. Who are the users? Are there other dominant stakeholders? Are there other interested parties? have they been consulted? Have we heard their issues and concerns? If we haven't, how can we come up with an efficient solution if we don't know the issues and concerns? We can come up with a solution, but is it efficient? Now, why do you need an efficient solution? Efficiency means that you are doing the right thing right if possible the first time but at least at the least cost uh, i'm not saying that things need to be cheap for everything but we need to make sure that 
the policies and programs that we have are efficient, not just effective, but efficient. So one way of doing this is to actually talk to people who have concerns about it. So far, do you, does anybody have any question? Can you understand me? Or am I going too fast? Are we okay? I take it as yes, okay? Because nobody's nobody has said anything in the in the chat either, I think. Oh, there are some questions. Okay, hold on. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Maybe you can answer the questions in the QA session. Later? Okay. Yes, later. All on. right. Okay. Yeah. I will you do that then. Do your presentation. Uh, but uh, everybody can understand me, right? So that would be because that's what I'm worried about. I cannot see anybody's face. <laughs> so let me just go to the other um, slide. So let's now look at how fintech in general have and are still tackling financial inclusion. Fintech is said to have the potential to benefit the underserved individuals and community. So financial inclusion means um, we are bringing together people who have not been in the banking system. So for example, um, it could be that in certain areas, uh, there are no physical banks. So people are still keeping their money like my late grandmother under her pillow. Bawah bantal. So simpan money, uh, simpan duit bawah bantal. And then going to shops and then using the money, cash money, duit kertas untuk bayar. So those, those are the the financial people who are not within the financial system. So one of the issues in for countries as big as Indonesia and as as um, uh, separated uh, island wise as Indonesia is how do you include everybody in this financial uh, system. So fintech is said to have the potential to benefit to benefit them through features such as uh, mobile money and e-wallet crowdfunding, um, uh, crowdfunding such as P2P lending, uh, uh, what is it, P2P lending, uh, what, um, that is, I forgot what it's, it's uh, called in Indonesia and in, uh, for that, uh, let me see, Pinjol, yes, that's it, Pinjol, so Pinjol or equity crowdfunding platform, alternative scoring, cross-border remittances, payment technology, technologies using digital KYC process and regulatory technology or red tech. It requires collaborations between the public sector institutions, private and public sector, sorry, private and third sector organizations in order to ensure that as many people as possible are included in this uh, in this banking system or financial systems. So let's think back about technology that we have mentioned earlier and try to relate them to financial inclusion. First one, um, let's talk about blockchain technology. As this has the potential um, to increase the transparency especially in places where there is a lot of distrust either in the banking system or the government system uh, because uh, blockchain technology or um, the distributed ledger technology uh, means that there is check and balance and it is not centralized at one place. So the, 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 the information, the data is being kept at many places. So if you want to change data at one place, then it will it will be flagged out that something has been changed because the other places have not been changed yet. So 
it's good when there is a law of distrust in the system, either the banking system or the government system. And um, it also helps with efficiency of payments, especially in the context of international remittances. And blockchain can also reinforce the security of the transaction, again, because of this chain um, concept and the overall potential to disrupt current banking models. So a lot of people believe that blockchain has the potential uh, is to disrupt the current banking models in the sense that you do not need a physical bank or the bank as we know it right now in order to engage people into the uh, financial services system. The second uh, technology uh, that can help with financial inclusion uh, would be the adoption of cloud computing technology in the financial sector, uh, meaning there is no need when you adopt cloud computing for a physical server at a specific location to support the community. So you can have uh, people in small islands of uh, Sundasi, and there is no bank there, no physical location there, but because you use cloud computing, they can be part of the system. For Indonesia, I think with the very challenging geography and the potential of natural disaster, um, not having to rely on physical location can be a huge benefit. The third technology I think that can help a lot in financial inclusion is big data analytics. Uh, this is because big data analytics um, have the potential to improve and give innovative ways of credit scoring. Now, being a, a former banker myself, uh, this is one of the, the weird thing about giving credit or give, uh, giving loans to people or financing. If the person has never had a loan before, then the likelihood of the person getting a loan is less. So it's like a chicken and egg situation. You need to have history on credit in order to get good credit. If you don't have good credit, then you cannot get credit. So chicken and egg situation. Again, with big data analytics, it is important because when we, we, we want to bring people in who have never been part of the banking system, we need to look at other things that can make the bank comfortable not just the bank, but the people giving them the, the loans, for example, comfortable that this person is trustworthy and that they can pay back what is required. Uh, the fourth technology uh, I want to talk about with uh, regard to financial inclusion is biometric technologies. Because this can help to enhance and increase the efficiency of Know Your Customer program uh, and client onboarding processes. The ones we normally associate with are the fingerprints, the iris scanning, the voice and facial recognition. But I also know of uh, a few fintech companies that are introducing cheaper ways of um, processing this biometric. So we'll, we'll, uh, I can't talk about it right now because uh, uh, I signed an, a non-disclosure agreement, but you'll see a lot of things coming that would be uh, very relevant to uh, places where cost is a big um, consideration. And the fifth one is RegTag. Why is RegTag important? Because without regulations, it is difficult to protect the people. And if the people are not being protected, then we're not doing our job as public sector managers. So RegTag helps to enhance compliance with global standards for financial stability and integrity, as well as domestic supervisory efficiency. Now, but when we talk about regulation, there should always be a 
proportionate regulatory approaches to fintech. So you can do sandbox, you can do reg lab, uh, but it is also important to hold dialogues with as many stakeholders as possible. So the combination of the rapid pace of this innovation in financial services and technology and the commitment of, to financial inclusion of many policy-making institutions in developing and emerging countries uh, helps with giving us more opportunity to resolve some of the most uh, challenging uh, issues to reach this last mile consumers, we call it with high quality financial services. It sounds impressive, isn't it? But a lot of it costs money. Is there a more cost effective way for smaller organizations? And how can public sector organizations take advantage of these innovations? Let's pause and think about it for a second. So, so the first one, blockchain. Um, what else can we use this for? How about grant applications and disbursements? So, it's something that's, that's the potential, uh, direct payment, collection or refund of taxes. Perhaps we can use blockchain or just, just the basic distributed ledger technology to initiate individuals, dialogues with individuals, groups, organizations, communities, and perhaps eventually co-create a policy or program. If there is mistrust in the system, then my belief is um, DLT, uh, distributed ledger technology, technology, that supports anonymity and transpa transparency is a good technology to enable all this uh, chain of processes. So any questions or suggestions from the public need to be answered or addressed can be done through DLT. I do have to add a proviso though, um, because trying to uh, do proof of work for blockchain, for example, use a lot of energy. So it could be expensive and time consuming, but, but if there is a cheaper energy alternative, this is a good option. And for Indonesia, I actually uh, have quite a few thoughts about how Indonesia can have cheaper energy alternative. Um, the sun, uh, water, those are all cheaper alternatives than how things are done right now. So perhaps it's a good option. The second one, cloud computing. Perfect for countries like Indonesia that consists of thousands of islands and also sit along the Pacific Ring of Fire uh, where there are several tectonic plates colliding. So it is something you should be thinking about. Some parts of governments in the UK and the US are already using cloud computing. And I also understand that the Indonesian government was planning to build a data storage system and computing power called cloud, uh, which is expected to operate in 2020. I'm not sure with COVID-19 and, and all that this is still going on, but it is, it is a good option. And the third one, now without going through every one of them, the third one, data analytics, big data analytics, again, with consent from the public, Data can be retrieved from their social media accounts, for example, to extract what they value and, um, and that are related to issues at hand. So we can use this uh, for not just having a history for their credit, if they want to apply credit, but also you would know whether the, this is something that they value. In short, as public managers, we don't need to think to innovate or think of something totally new. We just need to talk to people and organizations, be it private or third sector, to discover new potential use of existing technology and processes, as well as the challenges of these technologies and processes. So 
If we have a public value mindset, we will automatically think of people and organizations around the issue at hand and the process of collaboration might just start. Let's now look at one of the features that are becoming prominent in Indonesia, uh, the mobile payment. I know Pa Agung will be talking about uh, in, uh, fintech in Indonesia for even further. So I'm just going to, to touch a little bit on this. And the information on this slide is again based on Hannah's initial findings. Thank you, Hannah. She's somewhere on, on this webinar as well. And if need be, uh, because she's somewhere in this webinar, if we want to discuss this further, we can. According to uh, Hannah's research, 94% uh, of Indonesian population have access to smartphones. Now, remember earlier, I asked you to take out your ponsel and try and um, put something uh, uh, on the padlet using your ponsel. Normally, I when I give this guest lecture talk, normally I am in the campus and I'm talking to you uh, face to face. So most people normally would uh, put up their uh, handphone and start uh, typing in, which is good. But because we are on the webinar, I cannot really see uh, what it is, uh, whether you have your phone, but I'm quite sure you have. Um, and out of this 94%, 64% are active internet users. So extremely high numbers of population have smartphones and are active internet users. However, cashless payment usage rate is only 23%. And the interesting thing, again, I didn't put on this slide is during COVID, the rate of cashless payment, and Hannah can uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, actually went down rather than went up. So it, it, is, it is something that I don't know why. And I think the authorities don't know why either. So what are the issues contributing to this relatively low payment usage rate? Firstly, there is an even distribution of mobile infrastructure across Indonesia. And by, by that, we mean the signal and the internet connection, because in order to have um, trust in doing something, especially something to do with money, you need to have uh, the signal and the connection stable, uh, because otherwise you don't wanna send money out and then not know whether your money has gone out or have it gone out twice or three times. A uh, second issue is that the internet speed is relatively slow. Um, will that, that will probably be addressed when we have um, uh, quantum computing later on, but right now it is still relatively slow. And, but I think the more, um, Concerning is the low digital skills and financial literacy rates of people in the 15 provinces outside Jakarta. So we have Jakarta, which is near perfect, but we have a lot of issues when we go outside Jakarta. Hana also found that to adopt cashless payment, the Indonesian public requires one reliable and secure cashless transaction infrastructure, two, data, personal data protection, and three, the ease of use process. For example, if they need assistance, they can get assistance quite easily. And that the main thing is, in order for people to adopt cashless payment, uh, that there's this social value pressure from peers, peer pressure and habit. Those are the main reason why people adopt cashless payment, not because the government's asking them to do so. So if we are trying to use the public value concept and we talk to people, and then we find out that these are the things that they value. Uh, 
So maybe when we are doing our policy framework, then we can put all this into our plans of actions in the process, in the procedures, in the activities, so that your policy will become uh, successful more efficiently than how it is currently being um, done. Now let's take a few minutes to think about how we can relate this to taxation. As I understand, there are a lot of people interested in taxes here. I have to say, and I've mentioned this to Bu Indah as well, I'm not a tax expert, but I have read The Wealth of Nations written by one of our more illustrious alumnus, Adam Smith. So without going into details, he basically discussed uh, the canon of equity and fairness, the, which means that every person should pay the depending on the individual's ability to pay. Uh, the canon of certainty, uh, which says that a person should pay, uh, what, what they, the tax the person should pay should not be arbitrary. So it means that they should know it uh, in advance. The third canon is canon of convenience, which means the method and timing of tax payment should be convenient to the taxpayer. And the fourth is the canon of economy and efficiency, uh, which means the, ta the cost of collection should be low compared to the tax collected. Currently, there are not too many research on tax challenges with regards to fintech. Regardless, uh, fintech investments can give rise to a range of taxation issues and opportunities. So it is important that tax is considered upfront as part of your fintech strategy. Uh, there are issues uh, you would need to think of because fintech by nature um, can be a global company and a global citizen because most of it currently happens somewhere on the cloud. So where is the cloud? Does the existing domicile, non-domicile rule for taxing for tax still, still applicable then? How do you determine these are local or foreign income? How would you know the origin or the source of, for example, the income? Another interesting question that has come out, uh, come about in, even now is since COVID-19, a lot of companies has allowed people to work from home. And fintech organizations especially uh, have been doing that for quite some time, but it is now becoming more popular. How do you know um, that the people are working in Indonesia or they are employing Indonesian or the company is because the company is not Indonesian, or if the company is Indonesian, are they employing Indonesians or are they employing somebody else? Difficult to tell. Need to look into. I don't have an answer for you, I'm afraid. But these are all important questions for regulators to consider. And I'm sure you have considered them as well. So, but before I finish, I just want to quickly touch on these two issues, cybersecurity and ethics. With the increasing number of organizations involved in the digital world, as we see, there is a wide gap between regulation and the emerging technologies. Most of the time, we see the regulations are trying to keep up with the technologies. Also, we see there are many people participating in these new innovative solutions without really understanding the risk involved in, for example, the process or investment. This lack of regulation, knowledge and understanding of risk make it really important for fintech organizations to have strong business ethics. It is difficult to expect regulatory institutions to keep up and be responsible for something not under their jurisdiction. So uh, polytechnics, universities, schools are where you, you, you educate the next fintech 
entrepreneur. So I would encourage that within your uh, curriculum, within your syllabus, it is important for you to put in um, uh, courses or, or topics like business ethics so that things will be naturally ethical rather than being forced to be ethical. So in short, in the last uh, uh, 30, half an hour, 40 minutes, uh, what I have been trying to share with you today is that these technologies that are helping fintechs to innovate the financial services can also help public sector managers to improve their communication within the various public agencies, as well as with the public, including individuals, private and third sector organizations. This new potential can encourage collaboration, including co-creation and co-production of policies and programs with the public to address what the public really values. And by doing this, perhaps the aims and objectives of the policy and program will be attained in a more efficient manner. Terima kasih. If um, Bu, I will pass this back to Bu Indah because I'm not sure whether we're taking the questions now or we're going to take the questions later. Thank you very much. Um, maybe we should give a round of applause to Ibu Ramona for her enlightening presentation. I have learned a lot uh, from your presentation, Ibu. Especially, I was quite surprised uh, to read Hannah's research, because I thought it's the other way around. I thought during the pandemic, the, the use of cashless payment will be increasing, but uh, oh, she's got a very yeah. interesting uh, result. Thank you for sharing your insight and also your research yes. and Hannah's. I, I was also surprised when, when, when I saw that, but you know, data is data. <laughs> yes, yes. I think we should uh, follow up uh, that research. Exactly. Uh, with another research, yeah, to find out why. All right. Um, to all terima participants, kasih. yeah, terima kasih Ibu, once again, thank you very much. To all participants, uh, if you have any question for Ibu Ramona, please feel free to type your question in the chat room uh, on your Zoom app. And please do not hesitate to ask in Bahasa Indonesia as we will translate the questions for you. We've got some uh, questions in the chat room already, but we will try to answer as many questions as possible, maybe later on, after we have finished the second presentation. Okay, thank you, Ibu. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we move on to our second speaker, Bapak Agung, Christian Agung Prasetyo. Hello, Mas Agung, where are you? I'm right here. Yeah, there. Uh, all right. Okay. Let me introduce you in more detail uh, before you start your presentation. So I usually call him as Agung. Yeah, he's one of my colleagues. Um, he had uh, about 15 years experience uh, at the Director General of Taxes. And see, um, he also had experience as a trainer at the Tax Training Center before assuming his role as a lecturer here at the Polytechnic of State Finance Span. Mas Adin has published a lot of articles in academic journal, as well as in media such as the Jakarta Post. He has also published books and book chapters. And here is one of his books. Can you see the book? It's called Panduan Karya Tulis Ilmiah dengan Microsoft Word 365 dan 2019. And we will give this book away to one of the lucky participants. We will announce who is the lucky participant at the end of the webinar. Mas Agun will talk in about, <laughs> Mas Agun will talk in about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, he will be talking about the landscape and other related issues on uh, fintech in Indonesia. Mas Agung, the time is yours. Thank you, Amanda. So roughly I have 30 minutes, is that right? Yes, that's all right. Okay, that's, that's fine then. Let me share my screen. Where's my screen now? Here we go. 
Yep. Okay. Thank you, Vaina. Um, I'm going to talk about the, land, the current landscape of the fintech in Indonesia. I'm not going to talk about, um, I'll talk about facts, numbers, and stuff like that. And then and, and you can be judged for these numbers. So the numbers basically will speak for itself and, and you'll be, you'll be, um, you'll form your own opinion based on the numbers. Okay. As um, has been mentioned by Bu Ramona, fintech has been, has been, it's not a new invention, it's, it's, it's been a long way. And at the moment, it has been enjoying a really rapid growth in Indonesia. And so far, now we've got like 158 fintech companies registered in Autoritas Jasa Keuangan, which is the watchdog um, organization that basically supervises all financial activities in Indonesia. Ms. Agu, sorry, we cannot hear your voice clearly. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Yes. What about now? Can you hear my voice now? Hello? Hello, can you speak again? Can you hear my voice now? Uh, yes, we can, but it's uh, it's not too clear, not as, as clear as it was. microphone near my mouth <laughs> okay what about now yes uh it's better much better okay then the, it's the problem with my hardware okay currently we've got like 158 fintech companies registered in autoritas jasa Kewangan, which is the organization responsible for supervising the financial industries in indonesia most of these most of the fintechs are registered but only about 33 this runs 20% are licensed. So what this means is that those are registered will have to be licensed within one year. And if they're not, they will be, they will lose the license. Uh, they will lose the registration and then they will be unauthorized basically to, to operate in Indonesia as a fintech. So that's one thing that needs to be, to be, um, to be seen very carefully by the customers. And then in terms of assets, in terms of upsets, fintech in Indonesia have a huge amount of money that's been moving around, like more than 1,800 billion rupiahs currently um, in circulation within the fintech industry. And this is, this is, this is basically a lot of money, but, but most of this money, unfortunately, will, will unfortunately are scattered around Jabur Tetape area, which is Jakarta and the surrounding neighborhoods. The second city in, in Indonesia, the second biggest city is Rabai, only have four feedback companies. And in some of, in some of this, is, uh, uh, this is actually quite, quite um, related to what was said by Ibu Ramona, that there is a problem with, with possibly internet um, access within the Indonesian regions where mostly um, in the big cities in in Java, particularly in Jakarta and, and its surrounding neighborhood, they've got they've got a really good infrastructure in internet. And whereas in other regions of Indonesia, whereas in other regions of Indonesia, we will not we do not have the the we do not have the luxury of rapid um, internet connections. So fast, this is possibly possibly relates to why most companies are located in around Jakarta and the surrounding area. It is also probably caused by, by the fact that most, most business activities are in Jakarta, Bogor, Depok, or Tangerang. So that, and that's where all the monies are. So this, this is probably another reason why the, most of the fintech industry are located in Jakarta and its surrounding. And in terms of the, the company itself, uh, most of the companies in the fintech industry are local companies and only 55 of 158 are actually um, based from overseas and most are, uh, most are local. So, in, so this is a good news because, because local companies tend to be, to be regulated um, possibly quite easier because they are, they are based in, in, in the same, in the same um, in our country. 
as opposed to um, foreign, foreign, foreign companies. And again, this is, this, is, this is some of the, most of the, most of the FinTech industry here in, in Indonesia, they are mostly doing the payment industry and lending industry. With the payment, you could, you could see in the, in the form of like OFO or, or Gojek, where they've got a lot of, a lot of possibility to make payments. So ranging from buying, buying internet, um, recharge phone, buying groceries and stuff like that. And the second, second form of activity is the lending, where basically, like Bu Ramona was mentioned, it was, it was the peer-to-peer -peer lending or Pindol. And this is the second largest um, share of the fintech industry. There are also things like a blockchain, cryptocurrency, and insurance and also market aggregator but they are not as big as the payment and the lending system where basically dominates the fintech industry in indonesia and this is also a problem that we will discuss at the end of the presentation and again this is this is um a, a statistic showing the number of accounts either from borrowers and lenders we can see that, that there are a lot of accounts um, involving the lending and borrowing activities. Um, in terms of borrowing, there is an increase of like um, more than from 3,006, 3 million 600 um, account numbers in December and December 18. And it, it, the numbers are quadrupled more than 15 million in just one year. And that is the borrow. It shows that, that basically the lending and it reiterates that, that the lending is basically uh, one of the largest share in the fintech industry in Indonesia. The same is, and also same as the, the lender, whereas, whereas the, there's more than five times, a nearly five times increase in the number of lend, lender account in Indonesia. And most of these are unfortunately located in Java, possibly because most ec economic activity are located in Java, unfortunately and perhaps also caused by, by the uneven um, internet infrastructure uh, between Java and outside Java. And quite possibly these are located in Jakarta and, surround, and its surrounding neighborhood as well, as can be seen in this, in this statistic. And this is a bit unfortunate I, in my opinion. The next topic I'm going to talk about, this is related again, the importance of, of Pinjol in Indonesia whereas there is a, a huge increase in the amount of money that's actually circulating within the, the lending industry within FinTech. Um, only in one year, there was an increase from 19 million to nearly 17, sorry, trillion, to nearly, to nearly 17, 70 trillion of money in just one year. And there's a lot of money circulating in the FinTech industry. But then again, it is unfortunate that most of the money allocated in Java, it's probably, as I mentioned before, this is probably because um, as, as an indication that, that most of the economic activities are unfortunately in Java, although there are several, several rich, rich regions allocated in, in Kalimantan and Sumatra, but in terms of economic activity and, and um, related to FinTech, they are unfortunately still, still in around Java. And also the, this is the demographic about the users of the lenders and borrowers. We can see here that um, the borrowers and both the borrowers and the lenders are, are in the, oh, let me check my pointers. Uh, they are within the same geographic, the same demographic um, region mainly within the 19 and, and 34 years of it, which is, which, is, which is absolutely good because it shows that, that most of the users of the, of the borrowers and those who actually lending monies, they are in productive, in their productive, in the prime age, in their protective, protective age. So we can see here that most 70% of the borrowers are between 19 and 34 years of age and also nearly the same amount of lenders. They are also in the same, the same um, age group, which is really good, um, which, is, which is a sign that, that the, 
the, the make what the so-called demographic bonus in Indonesia is 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 at work. And most of the most of the lenders are actually um, males as opposed to females, whereas the borrowers they are roughly similar. The percentage between the say between female and and males. And this is um, a statistic about those who are unable to access to credit. And this is, again, this is, this is possibly quite the reason behind the, 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 the rapid growth of Pinjol in Indonesia, where most of Indonesia actually have a limited access to credit. Um, it is possibly because, because most of the uses in, of Pinjol, they are small and medium enterprises, whereas where their money, uh, where their income basically rely in the form of daily wages. And if they spend like three or four hours going to the banks, um, dealing with administrative vision to obtain, uh, uh, to obtain um, a certain amount of loan, then they will possibly lose uh, um, some money because, because otherwise the, the, the time can be used um, to open stores in the market as opposed to going to the bank. And with the use of Pinjol, they don't have to do, go to the bank and the money is, 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 is uh, the loan is available right in front of you, right in front of you using, only using the cell phone. And it is, that, is, that is possibly why, why, again, this is possibly um, the reason behind the rapid growth of lending as, as can be seen in this chart. And the next, the next, the next part, the next part is is what I call the unbanked situations, where basically it says, it says here that um, most of the Indonesian, most of Indonesian are are basically unbanked. They should be able to act to 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 be banked. What I mean by bank or unbanked is that they have accounts in bank, or in the form of saving accounts or in maybe loans. So these are the people, oh, the statistic says that there are nearly 50% of Indonesians that, that are unbanked, while they are actually bankable. There was a chart that, um, hang on, uh, uh, here we go. Um, this chart basically shows that, that there are people who are actually bankable, but they don't, they are not bankable, they are not banked. But these people, these bankable but unbanked people, they have access to mobile phones, they have access to smartphones, and they have, therefore, they have access to Pinjol. And they can serve both as a lender, because they have, they have money, they are bankable, and they can also serve as a borrower, because they, as, because they, have, they don't access, they, have, they, don't, they don't have access to, to the banking system as, as, as shown in this, in this chart. So, this, so that is why, this is probably why behind, behind the reason where there are, there are um, uh, many people are actually um, become lender and, and, and also at the same time, there are many people who can actually tap the resources provided by the lender. There is a statistic prepared by the IMF and the Asian Development Bank, where the, there, is, there is basically still untapped resources, financial resources in Indonesia. I don't have the current figure because of the, because of the COVID at the moment, but this is in, in previous years before the COVID. So Indonesia is basically a country where, where there are untapped resources, where there are people who are, who, are, who are able to provide lending, but, but they, don't, they are not unable to do so because, because of this, because of they are quite possibly unbanked. So the money is there, the money is there, um, but, but those money cannot be used. So those money is not effectively used to, to run the economy because you are not in the system. So FinTech, so FinTech basically provides a system where people can, can actually provide their money to be used by the, 
other people who are in need of money. So this is why this is why the lending is is the pindol the the peer to peer lending the pindol is actually the second biggest part of um, fintech activity in Indonesia after the payment system. So, but then uh, that's that's probably the the first reason behind the rapid growth the rapid growth of fintech in Indonesia. The second reason of the of the rapid growth of fintech is the high access of the internet. Again, it is true that Indonesia doesn't have um, the, the highest speed of internet connection, but once they are connected to the internet, Indonesia is spending more time on the internet than, 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 than in most countries. Than, than according to McKinsey, Indonesia spends more time on the internet than the Americans although we don't have the exactly the fastest internet connections. We also know, we also know that Indonesians, and Indonesians are um, an active user of Twitter, social media, and Facebook. So they, they're, basically, they're basically online quite a lot. Although we don't have the internet connection as fast as, it, as in our neighboring countries. So this is a potential. The second way, the second, the second reason, possibly the second reason behind the rapid growth of fintech Indonesia. And again, this is the statistic that I have shown you a little bit earlier, where there are people who actually have money, and and they have, and they have access to the the mobile phone. But otherwise, these people are quite possibly um, saving their money mostly. Um, outside the system. So using FinTech, they can actually meet with the possible, the possible borrowers. So FinTech actually acts as a kind of a mediator between those who are able to lend money, which is the, the, um, the lender, the one on the left part, and those who are able to actually use the money to do business, which is on the right part of, of the screen. And these people, the one who belongs to the to the right part of the screen, they are mostly those who are unable to um, have access to the to the official banking system for various reasons. Um, perhaps because they are unable to um, have to satisfy the the um, strict requirements of the banks, such as the such as the collateral, or or maybe they are uh, they are choosing they choose not to go to the bank because they they spend they, are, they they prefer to spend the money that sorry not the money they, they, they prefer to spend the time that they um, that they might use to go to the bank to maintain their stall instead. This is we're talking about the opportunity cost here, and then and then so fintech can actually uh, perform a role as as um, a mediator between those who can lend money and those who actually use the money to run run business activities and this is this is this is this is what Pinjol is all about and 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 this is made made it possible by the the massive internet access in in mostly big cities in Indonesia and quite possibly around Jakarta and it's in its around neighborhood and this is the um, as I have mentioned in the in my earlier slide where where the first part of the the largest part of the pie of the fintech industry is only is in the form of payment so we can we can see here the reason the reason um survey conducted by app any and i price it shows that gojek which is the online platform of of um fintech indonesia they enjoy the first the first rank in the fintech industry, which is, and they are, they are they are they are mostly moving in the in the payment industry. So if you if you open up a, a Gojek account, then you can see there is there is a GoPay, and in GoPay you can do a lot of things. You can you can order a food, you can you can order cars and object right and a lot of things. You can even pay groceries using GoPay. And the second part is OVO. The strength of OVO is that they have a lot of 
a lot of cooperation with small vendors in markets. So um, I live in in a place where there is a uh, where near uh, what's the so-called modern market, where there are where the basically many the so-called takilima um, come together in in a in a market in a marketplace in the certain marketplace and and small small vendors sweet vendors they actually use OVO to 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 accept payments and that's the, that's the, the key strength of OVO and then and then um, and there's another statistic but I don't have the statistic here that shows that. And especially during the COVID, the last, the, the several months of the COVID, of the COVID, of, of the COVID time, where a new app called the um, Shopee Pay, Shopee Pay actually goes to the first rank uh, because they have a strong connection with their marketplace, the Shopee marketplace. And some, some of the research company puts the Shopee um, on top of um, Gojek and, and Oppo. And most of these, and these are all mostly based on the, on the, on the payment system. And this is the, um, a little bit of statistics showing the behavior of most Indonesian in doing their online surfing, where most of the, on the there, are, there is um, more than a quarter of Indonesian, they actually use e-wallet, e-money, and, and elect, basically electronic payments uh, to pay their online to name their online shoppings. The largest part is still using the conventional bank transfer, but, but the number of, of shoppers that, that um, actually shopping using um, electronic money is, is increasing day by day. Um, the platform, the, the digital platform that is enjoying a rapid growth in Indonesia is possibly, quite possibly, is um, um, helped by the variety of product offered by the online online platform. This is this is what we can see in the case of Ovo and and Gojek, where you can basically do a lot of things, pay a lot of things in there. Where they, they offer a variety of of objects, and then they use they use the technology to actually actually make their services available to more people in, in, in more, more regions of Indonesia. Again, this is, this is um, most, of their, most, of their, most of their money, most of their market, market share are still located in Jakarta and its surrounding neighborhoods. But we can see, um, we can see that, that Gojek and, and, and OVO, they've, they've, they've gone They've gone to smaller cities. I've seen the services available in in my hometown in the eastern part of Java, which is quite 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 far from from Surabaya, and they've got Gojek available there. And again, this is this is this is um, this is made available by the the, by the the technology platform that they are using at the moment, mostly relying on the rapid rapid internet access, mobile internet access. But um, as I have mentioned, um, everything in the world is um, double-edged. Um, we have the so-called yin and yang. We also have Dr. Jekyll. But if we see Dr. Jekyll, we can, we can, we can always expect that we can expect Mr. Hart is looking around the corner. And if you are a fan of the Avengers, we can we can we, we have Bruce Banner, but if we, we have Bruce Banner, but you also have the Hulk. So the fintech is quite is is nearly the same. I've been talking about the 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 rapid use of 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 Gojek, the rapid use of Ovo, the rapid use of Pinjol, but those are the good sides, and there are also bad sides of fintech as well. Um, a few months ago. Uh, one of the largest newspapers of Indonesia was running a report on the negative side of Pinjol. And this is just one aspect of FinTech that is, has been sitting at the second largest part of, of FinTech market in Indonesia. And one of the, one of the um, problems located, one of the problems caused by the Pinjol, by the um, online lending, 
is um, the abusive the abusive way of collecting money from the customers. Um, and then, and there was there was a story run by the, by the by the newspaper um, that some of the customers were actually have have to pay more than seventy five million million rupiah, and and it's 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 all was and the it was starting all with only four million uh, lending. He borrows from only four millions. But then when the time due to make the payment, he just doesn't have the money. So he installed another, another Pinjol app and obtained another app. And it goes on like on and on and on. And in the end, he has um, like 15 Pinjol app installed in his smartphone. And it has between four to five million outstanding debts on its account. So 75 million. So in, in the end, he started with 4 million debt, and at the end of the day, he ended up with 75 million um, money to pay. And that's a lot of money. And that's, that's one problem. And when, when that happens, and the, the, the customers can, cannot actually make the payments, and that's when the difficulties start. When, then, when the collection is, is starting, um, some of the, some of the Pinjol companies, they're actually using and quite unethical behavior. The most common, the most common behavior is using, using the app to collect, to have access on the contacts saved in the phones. And so the, the person who are tasked in collecting the money, to collecting the debt, they are, they are making phone calls to the known associates of the customers. And the, um, because the customers, when they're installing the Pinjol app, they have granted access for the app to access the contact, to, to make phone calls, to, to, um, to access text messages, to make text messages. And this is very dangerous. And this is something that, 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 that I think the customers would realize. And when they are installing apps, they need, they need to pay really close attention to the permissions that, that the apps are asking whether the, the apps are asking to access, um, to access the contacts, whether the apps are asking to access the messages, the messaging services, where, where, where the apps are asking to have access to make phone calls. And most people don't realize that. And when the time comes, and when the time is to make the collection, and the debt collector actually trying, is trying really hard to collect money, um, they, they have actual access to, to, the, to the customer's private, private data. And this is a bit scary. And this is something that most people do not understand. And, um, and again, um, I'm going to return to what Ramona has, has said, that um, there, is, there need to be a dialogue between, between both the, the customers and, and also the public sector. And, and this is good. The dialogue is good, but I ha I also have to remind that 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 um, the dialogue can only take place if both parties have equal opportunity. If those parties have, if the two parties have equal knowledge, otherwise it will only be a one-sided approach with one party um, giving information and the other party is simply accepting, as in case in here, as in case in the pinjol. In, in the Pindal in the Pindal in Indonesia, so I think this is the future agenda that we need to to really really focus on. Meaning that we have to put to put more regulation in the fintech industry, um, so that so that so that the a potential potential um, um, activities that might put the customers in in subject to harmful behavior can be limited. And the risk of abuse um, made by other parties can also be some, somehow managed. And this is, can only happen if we provide adequate education to both the customers and, and the FinTech industry. The customers, because they need to realize that, that when they are installing something, 
they need to know that there is are there are consequences and and if they are entering a contract to into um with a fintech industry to obtain a certain debt and there are consequences with with because of their actions for the fintech industry uh, there is also the need to understand that um they are not operating without ethics yes um they are um they have they have they are exposed to certain risks if if the money is uncollected and they will be in trouble but but the money can only be collected in such a way that it will not it will not subject the, the customers to abuse or harmful behavior so so i think i think that's the future agenda that we need to talk about that we need to focus on the financial literacy the 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 financial literacy for the customers and then also the um the fintech industry making them aware that there is there is uh, there's ethics that they need to be taken account and they that they are operating operating not without limit they are operating in certain regulatory framework so so i think um in short all in all i can say that fintech is um at the moment is enjoying a quite a rapid growth in indonesia um it is sometimes a double edged shirt a double edge but it can carry a negative consequences but i think to improve the the um the financial the uh, the inclusion to to put more people into the system i think fintech is is um is, is necessary and, and 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 therefore i have to say that that fintech is is here to say um but with the things to work but we still we still need to there's still more work to be done in terms of customers and in terms of and also in terms of the of the um the fintech industry itself i think my 30 minutes is up now by inda thank you for the uh, attention and the cooperation and the all cooperation for the audience and i will go back to Buinda as the moderator. Thank you, Buinda. Thank you, Mas Agu. Uh, thank you for the concise presentation, although it was concise, but it contained a lot of important and interesting fact and information, and some of them confirm what have been presented by Ibu Ramona, as well as what we had in our eyes breaking at the yep. beginning of the session that FinTech could bring opportunities as well as challenges. And Mas Agung also provide us with uh, some insight into uh, what FinTech has in the future. I have always um, had respect for Mas Agung. He holds a PhD degree in taxation, but he could speak other topics outside taxation very well. So please give another round of applause for our second uh, speaker. All right. Okay. Bapak Ibu, para participant, are you still there? Because we are now uh, move to our next session, the Q&A session. We've got uh, about six questions in the chat room. If you still have any question, please feel free to write your question in the chat room uh, on the Zoom app. And please do not hesitate to ask in Bahasa Indonesia as I will translate the question for you. Uh, okay, uh, Ibu Ramona, are you ready to uh, for the Q&A session? I think yes. lots of, yes, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ibu. <laughs> thank you for the enthusiasm. Yeah, you are still smart. Okay, uh, I think most of them uh, are addressed for Ibu Ramona, but maybe uh, a few questions uh, which is asking about FinTech in Indonesia, maybe uh, the question can also be answered by Mas Agu. Okay, let me share my screen. Thank you everyone for uh, still joining us. Okay, please bear with me. Okay, can you see my screen? 
Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, maybe I will divide the session into two Q and A session. Each session will contain three questions, and each session will last in about fifteen minutes. Yeah. So in total, we have thirty minutes Q and A session. Is that all right with you, Ibu and Mas Agu? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Okay. I will read the first question. It comes from uh, Bapa Agam Said. Sarjana Hukum. Bapak Agam, I hope you are still here. Yeah, Bapak Said has a question for Ibu Ramona. What's the meaning of distributed ledger technology? I think it is in one of on one of your slides when you speak yes. about blockchain. Yeah. Yes, and then um, maybe I, I will read uh, three questions uh, all together. And then mm -hmm. the second question comes from uh, Bapak Ferry Irawan. Bapak Ferry asks a question uh, during the pandemic. How can we maintain national public value? And mm -hmm. the last one uh, is a question from Bapak Ferry Hutabara. He asked, uh, what programs are the government doing for the community? If there is any question uh, which is not clear, uh, I can ask the participant to uh, mm -hmm. ask the question themselves, uh, to turn on the microphone and ask the question in Bahasa Indonesia if you find the question. It's not clear. Okay. Please, Ibu Ramona, could you please answer the questions? Okay. Um, uh, Bapa Agam, uh, I can see you now. Uh, well, distribute, are you an accountant? Yes. Okay, good. Distributed ledger technology is based on the accounting ledger. So it has been around for as long as the Roman times, where you put in all the reports on... It's a report, but because it's a technology, this is now a digital report. The difference between the normal uh, report that we have is normally one person would have the original and then you have copies, right? So if you want to change, um, sometimes we don't know which is original and which is copy. But with distributed ledger uh, technology, instead of that information, being centralized so in one place it is in a lot of places it can be in thousands of places it depends on how many people participate in this uh, in this dlt so it is just a ledger it puts in information but it is not at one place it is at many places because of that people have a lot of people have access to it and in order for you to change something you need to tell the others that you're changing it. So you cannot quietly change something and make it happen because then the, the, the information is wrong at the other places. So that's the good and the bad thing about distributed ledger technology. Now, of course, when you have blockchain, blockchain basically stops people from doing anything to that information. So you cannot change it but you can add into it so it becomes bigger and bigger bigger so it becomes like a, a proper chain yeah does that answer your question Papa okay. Adam. okay good okay you so can move on to the second one the second one is how can we maintain public value during the pandemic i think it is extremely important during this mm -hmm. pandemic uh uh but ferry that we maintain the no sorry but uh, yeah Ferry, um, that we maintain this uh, national public value. Public value basically means that we need to maintain dialogues with the public, the, the, the companies, the organizations. So how can we do it? We can do it like this, webinars. We can do it through Otherwise, it does not necessarily mean that you need to be in the same room. I think for developing nations such as Indonesia, I'm, I'm Malaysian. I've, I've lived and worked in the UK for a long time, but I, I'm still a Malaysian. There is this distrust in information that you give to the government. You don't want them to know who you are, for example, but you want to give them a feedback. Thank you. Baba Ferry, is that answering your question? Okay, so 
so so if if we 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 can just use other ways of doing it. It's just a method of maintaining dialogues. Does that answer your question, Papa Ferry? The, the third one uh, is about what programs are governments doing for the community. Um, it depends on that the concept of public value do not differentiate between big programs such as policies of cashless payment and smaller programs such as uh, you know uh, helping the uh, people with with um, uh, food distribution, for example, if they have a disaster and then you want to distribute uh, food. The, the idea behind it is if something happens or if you want to introduce something, is this to a community? Is this something that the community want? Uh, my research, for example, sometimes, uh, this, this is probably an extreme. My research is on orang asli. And the government is giving a lot of money. They build houses for orang asli. But the orang asli does not want houses. They do not want money because that is of no value to them. What they want is land. So without speaking to the orang asli, we don't know what they want. We don't know what they value. So if we talk, if we use the concept of public value, we will, we will not be spending money that we shouldn't, for example. So it's the same concept. You can use it at any level. Uh, does that uh, help, uh, uh, Barry? Uh, yeah. yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question, Bapak Agam, Bapak Ferry, Ferry Irawan, and Ferry Huta Barat. Yeah. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, let's move on. Uh, to the second session of the Q&A, um, the other three questions from the participants. The first question is the question from Mas Nur Arif Nugraha. Yeah. Mas Arif asks about how do we connect between public mm -hmm. policy and public value and how is the best way to measure public value. And another question is from Bapak Wat Slamet. He asked, uh, what do you think about the FinTech in the future? Maybe this question can be answered by both speakers, mm -hmm. by, by Ibu Ramona as well as uh, by Mas Agu. Uh, is FinTech or will FinTech displace uh, the existing financial institution, especially commercial banks? Uh, interesting question. And the last one, uh, the last question comes from uh, Bapak Fahri Raditya Insani or Mas, is it Mas or Bapak? Okay, he asked what are the most influencing features of technology implemented in financing in the recent era, as well as the most important to be implemented in this COVID-19 pandemic era. Okay, the first question will be addressed to Ibu Ramona, the second question. Uh, we'll go to Ibu Ramona and Mas Agung, and um, I think for the third question can also be answered by both speakers. Yes. Please, Ibu. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, well, The question on how do you connect public policy and public value? So yes, the the in order to uh, develop or design public policy, you need to have the public value concept or mindset if you want to come up with the right policy that is thought as valuable by the people that you're trying to serve. So how do you connect it? Um, I'm going to give you an example of a country um, that is, has the holistic public value men uh, mentality before they come up with any policy, the policy idea can come up from the top or can come up from the bottom or can come up from the, uh, the colleagues of the public manager themselves. So it doesn't matter where the policy comes from. 
However, the next step that they will take is they will do a mapping. They will try and um, this, the, find out who are the people that will be affected by this, pol this new proposed policy. And are they going to be affected directly or indirectly? Then once they have identified these people or these organizations or these groups of community, they will then contact these people, this organization, these groups of community and start a dialogue on basically saying, look, these are what we think is required. What do you think? Is it right? Is it wrong? What do you think should be done instead? And all those things. So the connection is basically in the process of coming up with public policy, you need to have the public value mindset in order for you to make sure that the policy addresses the, the things that are valued by the public, rather than the things that you think are valuable. Does that answer Mas Arif? Don't know whether you're still here, Mas Arif. Mas Arif, are you still there? Okay, uh, let's no. assume it's, it's a yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so okay. For, for the second question, uh, Bapak Kuan, uh, what do I think uh, FinTech will displace the current commercial bank? No, I don't. Uh, I know I know a lot of people say that it will be displaced. However, the current commercial bank will change their business models in order to compete or even improve the services that they currently have uh, to be part of the um, environment, the financial services environment. So will the commercial bank look the way it is looking now? No, it will not. It, they will change their business model. So would they have a lot of branches? No, they will not. They will have more virtual digital banking. Will they be just um, looking at uh, corporate banks or individuals the way they do? No, they won't. There will be differences in that, but they, are, they will still be there. So that's, that's how I would look at it. I will um, I'll, uh, we'll hear what Pa Agung thinks about it, but from my perspective, uh, they will still be here, but different business model. And the, the third question, which is on uh, the most important uh, financing uh, technology, I think the most important in recent era specifically in Indonesia, I would say it would be the mobile banking. Because it's not just Indonesia, it's in a lot of developing nations and, uh, and less developing nations. A lot of people have Ponsel. And that is the most important thing that's happening. They don't bring cash anymore, but they have their phone. So I think the most important uh, influential feature of a uh, fintech right now is the mobile phone. So there are a lot of things that which I think you could do in order to address financial inclusion and any other innovation should be done using uh, the, the, the Ponsel. Uh, Pak Kuat and uh, uh, Mas, uh, Mas Fakri. Uh, okay. do, uh, do that answer your question? Kuat, Mas Fahri, are you still there? Thank you, yes. thank you, thank you so much. For okay. Your Terima kasih. Okay. Terima kasih. Terima kasih, Ibu Ramona, for answering the questions. Mas Agung, we would like to hear your thought as well on the second and third question, please. Thank you, Baida. For the second question from Pak Kwan, I think I'm in agreement with Ramona that that banks and fintech will still will still here. They will not go away. There will still people who use bank, and there will are other people who who will use fintech. But I I will add to what Ramona has mentioned is that 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 banks, some of the banks they they might them they may change their business models, but but. But, but there is also another way that, that banks might do. And I've seen um, plans made by the Indonesian 
Bank of BNE, Bank BNE, and then um, they're planning BNE and BTN. They are both in the same group. BN, BTN is owned by BNE, and those two bank alliances they were planning to make um, bid to purchase the company who operates Ling Aja. Ling Aja is a fintech owned by group of, of um, government-owned company, and the two two banks they are planning to make a move on purchasing fintech from the other company. So here we can say that that not only banks will try to change their business model, but sometimes sometimes they will also directly acquire by the, the fintech company um, so that they could they could have access to the profits that made by, by fintech without actually without actually doing anything on their behalf. They simply they simply buy it. That's it. It's easy as that. And the second part of Papahi, I think I want to mention the, the use of mobile phones, but let's not forget that that mobile phone will only work if there is a proper infrastructure. And we might have the, the most sophisticated mobile phones, and if we don't have a proper connection, then, then the mobile phone will not be very useful. So I think um, one of the most important features, in addition to the mobile phone, is the infrastructure behind the mobile phone itself. What is the, what is the quality of the internet connection in Indonesia? And how is it, how is it being used now by the companies? And is, it, is the, is the um, um, connection um, ready for purchase? I mean, is, it, is, is the price is, um, reasonable for most, for most um, of, of the customers? So I think that's my addition to Indah and to Ramona. Bu Indah, you're, you're muted. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Ibu. <laughs> Thank you, Mas Agung. So I will repeat myself again. <laughs> Thank you, Mas Agung, for adding uh, more perspective on the issue. I think uh, all of the six questions have been answered. Uh, is there any other question from the participant, either in Zoom or maybe in YouTube? Yeah, there are some participants who, who are watching this webinar in YouTube. No? Okay, if not, I think uh, we can wrap up our session today. Uh, before I uh, close the session, I would like to ask Ibu Ramona as well as Mas Agung to deliver their closing remark. Please, Ibu. Saya uh, start dulu ya, Pak, Pak Agung. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining uh, the, the webinar. I think my the, the reason why I like talking about this is because I think people in uh, public sector organizations, in polytechnics, in universities, in schools, you are the future. It, everything comes from you. Fintech is extremely, uh, have a lot of potential to improve lives. Don't think of fintech just as a way of making profit. Yes, making profit is good, but it is also a way of trying to improve life. And uh, it is you who will be the future. It is you who can uh, decide what is happening in Indonesia and the rest of the world. So what I would say to you is from this, if you have any questions on how it is, you can, uh, you can make your community better. Uh, do uh, you're more than welcome to try and contact me. You can just find my name and then uh, you can always contact me. And thank you again for, for listening and being patient and for understanding my really bad Indonesian and my really bad Malay. Thank you. Terima kasih. Thank you, Ibu. No, you are not bad. You are great. Okay, Ms. Agung, your closing remark, please. Okay, thank you, Bainda. Um, fintech is like a, a knife. If you go to the kitchen, you get a lot of knife. You find a lot of knife in the kitchen. You, you, you can use those knives to make beautiful cuisine. 
but you can also use the knife to kill someone. So it, FISA is just a tool and it can be dangerous and it can be useful. So it is up to you, but um, yeah, but um, it's going to be, it's, the fintech is going to stay with us. So it's up to you to use it really carefully so that you can, you can, you can actually make it useful for yourself other than, as opposed to harmful for yourself. Thank you, Mainda. Okay, thank you. That was uh, our closing remark from the speakers. When Bu Ramona spoke about you are the future, um, who will determine how our country will uh, continue in the future. Um, it was very touching, Ibu. I got goosebumps while hearing it. And I also agree with Mas Agung, uh, like any other uh, innovation, FinTech is like double-edged sword. Um, it has benefit, but it also could bring uh, some threat or challenges. But I believe uh, everyone, wherever you are, um, has learned a lot from the presentation uh, of Bu Ramona and Pa Agung, because I have. Uh, and I believe most of you uh, are working in the public sector. As a public managers, uh, we need to always, um, always remember, yeah, to always uh, put public value mindset. When we make a public policy in whatever area it is, including the financial services like FinTech, we also need to have a dialogue and to think about whether what we make, what program we make, will be valuable to other people who we serve. Okay, thank you very much everyone for joining us and thank you for, uh, for spending your Monday afternoon with us. Uh, before I hand over to MC, maybe we could do uh, some photo session together, yes? Okay, can I please ask everyone to turn on their video? Everyone, turn the video on please. And then please give us your biggest smile. Maswarso, are you ready to take the picture? Give uh, us your biggest smile, everyone. Okay, uh, ini di halaman pertama ada yang belum membuka kameranya, Pak Faizal, Mas Arif. Mohon bisa ini videonya. Hmm, Oke. Okay. Uh, Oke, okay, uh, semuanya melihat ke kamera ya. Uh, pada hitungan ketiga silakan senyum ke kamera. Oke. Okay. Tiga, dua, satu, senyum, cekrek. Ya, yeah, one more. Tiga, dua, satu, cekrek. Oke, okay, uh, freestyle ya, bisa uh, thumb up or maybe uh, love. Gitu ya, yep. uh, Tiga, dua, satu, cekrek. Ya, yeah. oke, okay, thank you. Thank you, Mas Warsa, the photographer. <laughs> okay, everyone, uh, thank you very much uh, again. Thank you, Bu Ramona. I hope you are always well, and I do hope we keep in touch. I hope we could do uh, some collaboration, yeah, research collaboration in the future. And inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. Okay. And also, thank you, Mas Agung. Thank you, all the participants, for your enthusiasm. You are excellent, luar biasa. Please stay safe and stay healthy. I will hand this over to Theo. Theo. Thank you so much, Ibu Inda, Ibu Ramona, and Bapak Agung uh, for the super fruitful webinar today. So now we come to the end session of today's webinar. It has been our pleasure, Polytechnic of State Finance Tan, to host this event. Hopefully, this webinar can bring so much benefit for all of us. Representing the committee and the team as your master of ceremony today. Once again, we would like to say thank you so much for the guest speakers and for everyone who joined this web webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Thank you for your time and your attention. Hope you all have a pleasant day and stay healthy. Thank you so much. Wabilahi taufiq wa hidayat. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Assalamualaikum.